As I've said several times uh, uh, before the messages in the last couple of years, we also have another option that you, uh, you could use if, if, if you're not uh, used to a paper Bible. That's still my favorite. I, it's hard to beat paper, I tell you. I don't know. Um, but the, we have a version app. On the version app, we've, we've set it up so that you can uh, go to settings and find events. And if you find our, our worship service there, and I think you've got to have an account through version. Is that right, Mark? You don't know? Okay. Yeah, all right. Well, maybe you don't. Um, and if you find, uh, you find our worship service there, then it gives you the scripture and the sermon notes. And, and I guess the advantage to doing it that way is that you can save those and you can add notes of your own. And uh, you're sort of building your own study Bible within that app uh, based on some notes and observations that you've made about uh, that text. It'll save it. But... Uh, uh, this morning we're going to uh, uh, pick up on a thread that we started pulling on in Ephesians chapter 4 a couple weeks ago. And that is that Christianity is a metamorphosis, a spiritual metamorphosis and not just a toolbox of ideas for spiritual or self-improvement. You know, we as Americans want our religion, I think, to work that way. We want to be able to, to go to a, a smorgasbord of ideas uh, for self-improvement and pick out what we want and, and kind of customize our own spirituality. Uh, but Christianity uh, does not give us that option. Uh, the Bible is not set up as a, a toolbox where you can go and say, I want a tool for fixing my marriage or I want a tool for uh, getting out of debt or uh, I want a tool for raising my children uh, in a better way, although the, the Bible does offer wisdom on those things. It is not primarily a toolbox for you to go in to add on those things to your life as though you are just sort of in an act of self-improvement or self-actualization, trying to, to uh, uh, create more satisfaction in your life that way. Uh, no, it's a metamorphosis, not a toolbox. Um, we saw in Ephesians chapter 4 a couple of weeks ago that, that it's about putting off an old nature, a nature that was resistant to God. A nature that did not want to respond to Him. And then putting on a new one. And this new nature that's crafted into your heart by the Holy Spirit is a new disposition toward God. A new love for God. A new desire to bring Him glory. Uh, which was uh, the original design for human beings. And so it's about this metamorphosis. And as we... Learn to live according to this new nature, this new principle that's been placed in our hearts. We come to resemble Jesus Christ. He is our standard. He is our measuring stick in this. Uh, we have been declared to be children of God by God the Father. And now we are becoming like a child of God. We're co becoming, coming to resem resemble the true Son of God in the way that we live our lives and the way that our character is shaped. And so really the rest of the book of Ephesians is, is a description of what that new nature that the Spirit has planted in you, what that new nature looks like in action. What it looks like inside your house. Um, within your marital relationship. What it looks like as a mom or a dad. What it looks like when you are at work. What it looks like within the context of your various relationships within your life. And so that's what we're going to be doing as we finish up the book of Ephesians. And in our passage today, Paul is going to describe some of the, some of the general characteristics of that new nature. Uh, something that should be evidenced by someone who is living according to the new nature. And so we have Ephesians chapter 4 beginning in verse 25. If you would follow along in your Bibles as I read it please. And then we're going to come back to various portions of it throughout the sermon. Verse 25. Therefore having put away falsehood let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members are of one another. Now he's, he's really talking about relationships within the context of the church there, members of one another. But I, I do think this being truthful applies to all of your relationships. Um, verse 26, 
Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Now that's a key idea we're going to work on here. By whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. Along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender hearted. Forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Now Paul makes a, a very subtle but very important point in verse 30. And I want to begin there. We need to realize that God is so gracious that he not only has placed this new nature in our soul and in our heart, but he's also given us someone who guides us in that, who guides us to live by the new nature, and it's the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is, is dedicated to every child of God so that that child of God can begin to live like a child of God. He is called the Spirit of Sonship. He is applying this idea of you being a child of God, a son of God to your life so that it begins to look like you are living like one. It begins to affect your character and the way that you decide things and live and make choices. Now, I can totally relate to the Holy Spirit in this activity that he does on our behalf. As a, as a parent, number one, and also as a former grade school teacher. Now, if you have been a teacher for any length of time, you will think that I am crazy when I say this, but my favorite thing to teach when I taught my fourth graders was writing. Do you remember that, Jennifer? Yeah, she suffered through many a writing lesson in my class and uh, people would say well writing uh, that's a that's a very difficult topic I mean it's very um, uh, subjective uh, it's hard to teach hard to translate to kids you know what makes writing good and how to apply that but but there was nothing as satisfying to me as to see a kid turn a corner with their writing and 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 just begin to realize uh, that their writing could be powerful uh, that their, write, their writing can be effective, that it could be a, a great tool for communication. But one of the things as a writing teacher that I oftentimes struggled with was this idea of capital letters at the beginning of a sentence. Um, for some reason, when fourth graders came to me, uh, they acted like they'd never been taught that. And so as they wrote their sentences and began to write, uh, you know, uh, without fail, almost all of them would write their sentences with a lowercase letter to begin with. And so I would take that student aside uh, oftentimes afterwards and, and I would say, well, hey, uh, did you not know? Uh, you begin a sentence with a capital letter. And they would say, well, yeah, I knew that. Well, why don't you start with a capital letter then? Well, I don't know. Is it because making a cursive capital letter is, is hard? Um, sort of. Well, just fake a capital letter. I don't care. Show me that you can write a capital letter to start a sentence. And invariably, uh, they still would not do that. I don't know, was it texting or something that, that causes everybody to avoid capital letters like the plague? Hey, I don't know. But, 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 but it's like that with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has dedicated himself to us not to help us write capital letters, but, but to help us produce the Christ-like character of the new nature. He is our teacher. He is our guide in that. And so as believers, we ought to aim to please that teacher. To please the Holy Spirit and live according to the new nature. Because according to Paul in verse 30, we grieve the Spirit when we refuse to cooperate with his leading in this. We just have a, have a remnant of that 
fallen desire to do things our own way that just wants us, wants to propel us to be a bad student uh, for the Holy Spirit in this. And sometimes I, I have to wonder if it seems like to the Holy Spirit, he's sort of dragging us along in our sanctification, in our growth, as we are kicking and screaming. But if we don't cooperate with the Spirit, what we'll eventually do is not only grieve the Spirit, but according to 1 Thessalonians 5, we're going to begin to quench the Spirit. And this means that we thwart his attempts to bring about this transformation in our lives. He's dedicated himself to do that with us. And, and to quench him is to thwart that, to cut him off. And um, we have to realize that that's really not a viable option for us as children of God, to, to ignore the Spirit, to thwart the Spirit, to quench the Spirit, to grieve Him. Because as the writer of Hebrews says, our, our Heavenly Father is, isn't going to just stand idly by and watch someone who, ha, who He has adopted as a son fail to begin to live up to that identity. And so God then disciplines His children. Through provide, uh, divine providence, he, he, he might allow a suffering uh, event or a trial or, or some other uh, event in our lives as an act of correction, a sort of divine spanking, if you will, to get his children back on path. Or if you prefer, a divine timeout, maybe. Is that better nowadays to say it that way? Okay. But it's in our best interest to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. And we do this through obedience and through reliance on the Holy Spirit. We, we obey Him as we, as we listen to and we follow His voice in Scripture. And as we begin to follow that voice, as we begin to submit to it, we begin to resemble Christ in our character. And we also need to rely on the Holy Spirit for this transformation because He is the one who provides the enabling strength for you to live up to that Standard, as we already saw in Ephesians chapter 2, the Spirit is the one who strengthens us with power in our inner being so that Christ may dwell richly in our hearts. And so we ought to be cooperating with this teacher instead of causing him gray hair like this patch back here of all those failures to write capital letters in my classroom. And so as we cooperate with the Spirit's leading... Uh, we ought to be demonstrating these character qualities of the new nature. And that's what we're going to look at in this passage. Paul speaks to several of them. And so let's kind of take a look at each in detail. These are sort of observable outcomes of the Spirit's leading, the Spirit's guidance in your life. And they're self-explanatory, I think, probably, but I'm going to go ahead and beat these dead horses anyway. Okay? So first of all, the new nature in action as led by the Holy Spirit is different in integrity. While the old nature tended toward deceitfulness, the new nature is becoming trustworthy. And we see this in verse 25 where Paul writes, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are all members of one another. And so the old nature was willing to, to lie and to, to, de to deceive for selfish gain. And, and, and not just with bold-faced lies, but through subtle acts of deception. Things like, you know, fudging your numbers for your income tax return. Or fudging the, the numbers that are on your hour, hourly report sheet, the time sheet that you hand in to your boss. Or, or cheating on a test of some sort or, or trying to embellish your character when you tell stories about yourself with other people to try to elevate yourself in a way that really is, is being deceitful. But the character of our new nature demands truth. It demands honesty even if the truth is inconvenient, especially when the truth is inconvenient. It seems like we go through uh, uh, one of these sort of uh, episodes in our household almost every week. You know, mom is our, our, our wonderful grocery shopper. I mean, she is, is such a, 
uh, an efficient grocery shopper and she buys things, we set up a menu and she buys exactly for what we're going to eat that week to save money. And invariably she, uh, she buys something that, uh, you know, she sets aside for a special purposes. And, and the rest of us just kind of raid that. And we begin eating the things that we should not touch. And they're usually something sweet, you know, cookies or, you know, things like that. And so uh, Shelly, in love, says, who ate my stuff? And uh, obviously it's, uh, uh, at that point, a test of the rest of our integrity, right? That, that, that we would come forward, even when we do wrong. Um, that's the integrity of the new nature, that we would be willing to demonstrate it in those situations as well. It kind of reminds me of the, uh, the story about Abraham Lincoln. Um, you know, one time Abraham Lincoln was, uh, uh, was in sort of a contentious argument with one of his uh, political adversaries. And, uh, and so Lincoln, at the very end of the argument, um, tells a story to make a point about integrity. So he asks this man, he says, um, how, many, how, many, how many legs does a cow have? And the man sort of put off that he would be asked such a foolish question like that, said, well, four. But what does that have to do with anything? And then Lincoln said, well, okay, so, so what if we called the cow's tail a leg? Um, how, many, how many legs would the cow have then? And his adversary just kind of scoffed at it. And I said, well, I suppose five legs at that point, right? And Lincoln said, wrong. Doesn't matter what you call the tail. Cow always has four legs. It's a matter of integrity. And that's what the new nature is driving us toward. And that's what the Spirit is leading us toward. Now, now the second outcome of the new nature in action is that it's different in regards to anger. While the old nature tended toward inappropriate anger, the new nature demonstrates appropriate anger. We see this in verses 26 and 27. Paul says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Now notice here that Paul says that anger can be a legitimate emotion. He says, Be angry, right? After all, Jesus demonstrated anger at times in his public life and ministry. And one, uh, one of those times that comes to mind is when he overturned the money changers' tables in the temple. They were extorting the people of God who were coming there to buy uh, sacrifices for the temple. And if we begin to live according to the new nature, we, we should find ourselves being angry at the things that anger God. After all, this new nature is leading us, as we saw uh, a couple weeks ago, to be imitators of God. And for example, I mean, how, how, could you, how could you look at an act of injustice, maybe something like a child being abused, and not feel an appropriate amount of righteous anger at that? And so there is a legitimate place for anger. And anger can, can properly motivate us to do good. We can go and, and we can advocate for that child. Or we can, we can go and we can help those who are oppressed in, in, in some way, be, being motivated by good anger in our hearts. But unlike God, anger in our hearts can often burn in very destructive ways. You know, it's like fire. It's fire in the fireplace is good. But fire on the couch is bad. And it's that way with anger very often. We often let our anger burn unproductively. First of all, we, we tend to be angry over the wrong things. We tend to be angry less over matters of righteousness and more over matters of personal slight. You know, things like uh, uh, the, the person who, who cut me off in traffic. Or... I, I, was, I was passed over for a, a, a job promotion. Or, or maybe someone ignored me and, and, and maybe they didn't even mean to ignore me, but I, but I take slight in that. And see, the problem in those situations is not righteous anger. The problem in those situations is that we think too highly of our own honor. 
And that's the sort of situation that Jesus commands us to turn the other cheek in as he taught in the Sermon on the Mount. Saying, don't be petty. Don't be, don't be angry over petty things. That's, that's, that's a very unproductive form of fire when it comes to anger. Secondly, we, we don't often deal with anger in a very productive way, even when it's righteous. We often let it simmer under the surface until it blows like a, like a pressure cooker. It's kind of like the, the lady who once said, you know, I, I know how to deal with my anger. You know, I just, uh, I just wait till I can't handle it anymore, then I just blow off at somebody. Well, that's kind of like a shotgun, isn't it? Now, would you apply a shotgun to that same situation? Can you just blow off at somebody? Paul says, don't let it simmer. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't let it stay long. Anger makes a horrible long-term guest in your heart. It should only visit and then move on. Because if you let it sit there, it's going to settle into bitterness. And bitterness is a festering sore on your soul that can be hard to get rid of. Uh, many of you who, who have been um, hurt in the past by various situations can speak to that. Uh, you know, allowing the, the anger of that moment just sort of to settle in. And, and once bitterness takes root, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's very hard to eliminate that. It's very hard to pull it up out by its roots from your heart. But we, it is in our best interest to do so and to deal with anger quickly so that it can't take root like that. Because as Paul says, Satan can use that as an opportunity for evil. Lots of hate can issue forth from the heart that won't forgive. It, 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 can, it can ruin relationships. In fact, that is Satan's design. It, it can destroy marriages. It can divide the body of Christ. Don't let your anger do that. It's as though when you let anger settle there and stay there, there's a tool sticking out of your chest, out of your heart that Satan can use to guide you and use you as a tool for his chaos, for his destruction. So don't be a tool of Satan. Deal with your anger productively, depending on what the situation demands, and always forgive. Step one, always forgive. Always forgive. Have I, have I made it clear how important that is? Always forgive. Let me say it again. Do not think that you are the exception to Christ's mandate, that his followers be forgivers. Always forgive. Let go of that in your heart. And if necessary and possible, put on humility and go attempt to talk productively with the person who's caused the offense. And sometimes you need to have some extra wisdom to guide you in that situation. Maybe a third party that can give you counsel as to whether or not that would be good. And if not, you let it go. As Romans 12 says, you must leave room for God to judge. That's Paul's polite way of saying, get out of God's way and let him handle it. And he will judge it. He will either judge that sin in an eternity in hell, or he will judge it on the cross, depending on the faith and the reaction of the person who committed the sin. And we really ought to be cultivating the, uh, the desire in our heart that they be saved. That that sin is judged at the cross. But the point is, let God do it. He is the one. Anger can be a good servant. It's in the fireplace. But it can be a horrible master. It's on the couch. And so the new nature is different in integrity. It's different in the handling of anger. And also, number three, it is different in regards to work ethic. While the old nature tended toward laziness, that's the point that Paul is making here, uh, the new nature demonstrates dignity in work. We see that in verse 28, 
where Paul says, let the thief no longer steal. In other words, he, he's implying that the thief steals because the thief doesn't want to work. But rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Now I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this aspect of the new nature this morning because we're going we're to hit it again later in the book of Ephesians. But I just want to say that, that the old nature has two dreadful tendencies when it comes to work. As Paul indicates here, it, it can tend toward laziness. It does not want to work. It does not see the dignity in work. Or, number two, and Paul doesn't say it here, but we'll cover that later, like I said, it'll tend toward idolatry of work. It, it'll elevate what you do for a career or a job or whatever it is to a level of idolatry. It'll raise that in your understanding, that, that job that you do to a sort of God level in your life. Uh, to where it's the one that gives you purpose. It's the one that gives you the sort of significance that, that God should be giving you. And so that's another tendency of the old nature. But with our new nature, I hope we realize that there's, there's dignity in all kinds of work. It doesn't matter what the work is. I suppose you probably couldn't, couldn't rob a bank and, and still be dignified in this or do it to the glory of God, but any sort of positive or, or productive work. And um, we, we can do that, like I said, to the glory of God. You know, whether it's, 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 it's handling financials or whether it's teaching or farming or, or whether it's just a, a, a short, uh, short-term task like taking out the trash. Um, Paul says this radical thing, those all things can be done to the glory of God. And we're going to look at how that can be so later in Ephesians as Paul teaches us to do everything as unto the Lord. And Paul also says here, just uh, quickly to make note of, the, of this, that the financial gain that, that, that we accumulate through work is, is not to be hoarded. It's, it's not to be in order to build our own little kingdom but in order that we might have something to give, he says. Another outcome of the new nature, number four, is that it's different in regards to speech. While the old nature tended toward corrupting speech, Paul says, the new nature demonstrates edifying speech, speech that builds up as fits the occasion, he says. Verse 29, where he writes, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And so the old nature tended toward this idea of corrupting talk. And that word for corrupting there is the same word that they would use for food or, or fruit or, or some sort of food item that, 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 that is rotting, uh, that's sitting there in your trash can and it's beginning to, to smell up. Uh, the house, or if it's an apple, I've heard that a rotten apple actually spoils the rest of the bunch. Somehow that rot works its way through there, uh, unless that's like an old wives' tale, I don't know. But this is a description of, of, of the corrupting effect of, uh, of speech that, that is not according to the new nature. It's describing slander and, and gossip and, and coarse and foul talk and, and innuendo of all kinds. And we all know that uh, the, the sort of effect that this has on us, right? I mean, when you're around it at first, you're going, ooh, that's a rotten piece of food. Smelling up the place, right? It's easily recognizable. And, uh, uh, and so we, we were sort of repulsed by it at first, but there's something about us that, that's also uh, uh, tempted to, after a while, join in on it. Uh, that corrupting talk can actually corrupt our talk. It, it can affect our speech and our habits in that. And Paul's saying that should not be so for the new nature. The mouth of the new nature is formed for wisdom, to share wisdom. It, it's meant to, to share words that edify, that strengthen and build up depending on the occasion that they're needed for. I love what Psalm 141 says about the mouth. And I, I think that I would do well. I think that we would all do well to take this to heart. Psalm 141 verse 3. Where it says, Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. 
Keep watch over the door of my lips. What would it look like for you to live as though the Holy Spirit were guarding the door of your mouth? It would look like you were living according to the new nature. Okay? Lastly, um, with this new nature, it's, it's different in regards to integrity, anger, work ethic, and speech. And then finally, it's different in regards to conflict. Uh, while the, the old nature tended towards strife, division, disunity, uh, the new nature is peacemaking. Verses 31 and 32, Paul says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Now let me... Let me let you in on a very disappointing truth about this world. Okay, it's a very disappointing truth. I wish I could change this for us. There is no way that any of us is going to escape conflict in this life. It was Job put it in Job chapter 5, which by the way our men are studying right now. Very good study, James. Thank you for that. As Job chapter 5 says, man is born to trouble just like sparks from the fire fly upward. And so, you can't avoid it if you try it. Even if you were an ostrich and, and, uh, uh, and you were trying to stick your head in the sand so that you could avoid conflict, conflict will sneak up behind you and get you in the rear end, I think, probably, even in this world. So it's difficult to avoid. And so the question is, how will you resolve conflict? The new nature demands that you be a peacemaker. It demands, especially within the church, as he's, he's, he's talking in that context here in this passage, that within God's family, uh, that we be peacemakers. And, and, and certainly this applies to our other relationships outside of that. And so how do we do that? Well, that's, that's a good question. Now, I'm just going to give you a simple framework, I think, that every person who wants to be a peacemaker can use when they approach a situation of conflict, okay? Whenever conflict arises, we need to put a priority, as much priority on maintaining a peaceful relationship with the individual as in solving the issue that caused the conflict. This means that when we approach the conflict, the relationship with that person is equally as important as the issue that caused the conflict. And that, show, that, that, that frames how you approach conflict. Uh, most of the time, we just throw caution into the wind. And, and our relationship with that person is a secondary thing, right? And so we abandon the relationship and drill down on the conflict to the point where we'll burn their house down. If it means that, you know, that we win in this situation of conflict. And so that's a pretty good framework with which to um, approach being a peacemaker, being someone who resolves conflict the way that Christ-like character demands. And I'd also like to put a plug in for um, uh, a, a curriculum that we have on Right Now Media. I don't know how many of you uh, have an account to Right Now Media. Um, but if you don't, it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, library of, of different uh, 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 teachings and tools and that sort of thing. But there's a curriculum and they're called Peacemakers. And uh, it's worth watching um, and drilling down on some different things that you can do to uh, maintain a relationship of peace with others. And I guess uh, as sort of a way to cap off uh, this passage this morning, I, 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 I think that I'd like to ask the question, what, what amount of joy or, or what amount of grief, perhaps, are you causing the Spirit right now? His desire is to move you along in every one of these areas of character in your life. And it ought to be our desire to bring Him joy, to cooperate with with his work. And if you and, and you know, I'm convicted by many of the things that Paul says here, but if you 
were particularly convicted about one of these areas of character, uh, then what I would suggest is that you need to lean into the Holy Spirit to bring about transformation in that area of your life. You know, lean into Him. Um, go to the throne of grace. Go to the Father and ask Him for that inner enabling power to make the change that you need to make in that area. Ask Him to strengthen you so that the character of Christ may dwell richly in your heart and especially in that context where maybe you're struggling a bit. And then have the Spirit continually speak to you about that. Have Him remind you what it's like to be a son of God in that situation. Go to Scripture. Find the passages that, that, that speak to that area and just meditate. Make that your thought that you wake up to in the morning. Make that the thought you come back to during the day. Take that idea and just, just twirl it around in your mind and make it a constant reminder of what the Spirit is leading you to do. Because wouldn't it be an amazing thing for us to be a body of people who are led by the Spirit in such a way that this group manifests the character of Christ. That, that, that we could be a light shining for Jesus Christ, not only in sharing the gospel, but in the way that his character is being evidenced in our lives. And so, may the Spirit teach you and guide you and strengthen you in those things. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Um, you've really, <laughs> you've left us without excuse. Uh, you've changed our hearts. That was a miracle. And now there's something in there beating for God. And, uh, and then you've given us this, this helper. You've given us this teacher and this guide uh, to help us progress in the area of sonship, in the area of, of living like a genuine child of God. And I just pray, Father, that we would lean into those things. Strengthen us to that end. And we ask this in the great name of Jesus Christ. Amen.